Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 11, 11 a.m. It's on a given Tuesday. And we have Kevin Nude from the School of Architecture at UH Manoa. Very important school, a very important professor there. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the show. Let's talk. Morning, Jay. Um, nice to be back. Um, well, I'm here to talk about uh, your country and kind of my country's uh, best known architect, um, Frank Lloyd Wright. And I would argue um, justifiably the, the best known American architect. Uh, uh, he's been dead for more than uh, well over 50 years now, but uh, uh, nobody really has come close to his reputation. And um, I spent a a large chunk of my career uh, looking at his particular relationship with Japan and um, specifically what he learned from Japan. Um, it was uh, a source of speculation for, for many decades uh, because he spent time there and, and collected Japanese prints, but nobody really uh, looked seriously at, at what exactly did he learn um, and how did it relate to his work. Um, uh, in in the US. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, he's, for those who don't know, um, he's the designer of, of icons like Falling Water, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, uh, you know, buildings that even if you don't know the architect, you probably know that building um, and hundreds of others, um, prodigiously um, productive. So um, if we could bring up the the first image. Um, this is the first building uh, that I believe that Wright would have, uh, first Japanese building that Wright would have experienced. It's the one on the bottom, um, which was built by the Japanese government in South Chicago in Jackson Park and remained there for 50 years. So Wright had um, a, an example on his doorstep for half a century. This was 25 years before he ever set foot in Japan for the first time in 1905. And if we go to the next image, um, uh, we can see on the left uh, the plan of the uh, Phoenix Hall, uh, the building that was built in Chicago, and below it is the plan of Wright's Imperial Hotel in, in Tokyo. And you can see that, well, they're different, but one could be extruded from the other. Now, there's no way to prove this, but um, this was an imperial building, and um, Wright would have been smart to base that plan on a classical um, Japanese example. On the right, uh, we see uh, a an ordinary Japanese house published in a well-known book, um, Japanese Homes and Their Surroundings, and Wright appears in the 1930s of, to have based a model house on that plan, but in, in a way that um, had different spatial relationships, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, most uh, strikingly, uh, Wright visited a well-known tourist spot about 100 miles north of Tokyo in 1905, um, and he looked at the, um, the Toshogu, which is the, the famous building there, but also, uh, if we look at the next image, um, the, uh, the building top left is the Nikotayu Inn. And he came back, Wright comes back in 1905 um, to uh, Oak Park, and the Oak Park uh, Unitarian Church gets hit by lightning that summer. Wright's replacement uh, looks very different uh, externally, but if you look at the plans of the two, uh, they're almost identical. There's the, the, a, a three-part plan. Uh, in this case, in Wright's case, he makes the entrance in the middle. So there are these direct formal relationships, uh, not so much in the three-dimensional appearance of these buildings, but at a deeper uh, level of the underlying plan. Um, if we go to the next couple of images, well, I can just finish up on, um, some examples where there appears to be uh, a family resemblance, put it that way. Um, bottom left is a gasho, uh, which is Japanese for praying um, type of Japanese farmhouse. And on the bottom right is Wright's uh, Unitarian Church in Madison, Wisconsin. And if you look at the angles, you know, the angle of prayer in Japan is more vertical and in the West, uh, as you know, not quite um, the same. But there are some parallels, and one wonders if, if there was a direct relationship that Wright would have known of what that word gasho meant. Um, last slide in this sequence looks at uh, a range of, of images. On the left, uh, an obscure little temple that projects out into um, Lake Biwa in central uh, uh, western Japan, and an unbuilt wedding chapel that Wright built for the Claremont Hotel. Probably a good thing that he didn't build it in this case. The Claremont, uh, for anyone who knows it, is is um, in Oakland or on the border of Oakland and a, a beautiful structure. I'm not sure this would have added to it. But then an example on the right, um, 
This is how you would top right, is how you would have uh, traditionally entered the Heian Kaku, um, a building which is now in the grounds of uh, uh, Higashi Honganji Temple in, in um, Kyoto. And this is the way that, well, you don't enter Falling Water this way, but Falling Water has this extraordinary staircase that goes nowhere. It just goes down to the, um, to the brook, to the stream. And uh, Clay Lancaster, a, a scholar who wrote the book on Japanese influence in America, quite literally, he first brought up this parallel. So uh, uh, as you can see, there are some direct um, kind of formal relationships. Um, and that was, uh, I think, something that wasn't as clear before. People thought the, that there was a, quotes, Japanese feel or aesthetic to Wright's work. And one of the things uh, that came out of that early work was, well, you know, there are actually some direct plan uh, influences there. The big part of what came out of that work, though, was, was less to do with specific buildings coming from Japan, um, although that was interesting, um, particularly in the way that Wright borrowed those, um, in a way that didn't produce something that looked in anything, in any way, um, Japanese, and yet the sources in some cases are quite clear. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned um, in the conversation about cultural appropriation or the difference between that and misappropriation um, from those examples. But if you go to the next image, this is how I believe that Wright learned um, or interpreted uh, the meaning of the, the term organic. Uh, I won't go into the background, but organic at the, in the late part of the 19th century um, was interpreted by people like Immanuel Kant and, and many Western, other Western philosophers as meaning um, something that was split into parts that were interdependent. So, you know, all of our organs are interdependent and we can't really lose many of them without the whole dying off basically. So, so that's the basic meaning and, and right, I believe, he refers to the image on the left uh, by Katsusika Hokusai, a print artist. And you can see how a natural form is being produced by geometrical shapes. And Wright does something very similar in both his plans and his decorative designs, where there are these overlapping, um, interlocking forms, which he described as organic. And many people, especially when he was using rectilinear geometry, were very confused by that sort of, uh, how could squares and triangles possibly be organic? And the answer is, um, well, it, it wasn't so much the geometry as their interdependent relationship. So if you go to the next uh, image, um, we see a traditional interlocking square pattern that you would see on Japanese shoji, for example. And then here's the, the life house that we saw earlier. And this shows how the interior spaces actually interlock. He's removed the, the walls where the rooms would um, have overlapped. And you get a very different um, kind of spatial um, signature and this interpenetrating space became Wright's kind of architectural signature then but he was seeing that as organic in the meaning uh, or in the sense of interdependent um, so interdependence gets interpreted as interlocking or overlapping so we just look at the last three images um, this is an example of um, uh, Hokusai again breaking the conventional picture frame suggesting that space uh, represented or made space and, and real space then are not discontinuous, that the frame, you know, is just an arbitrary separation. Wright does almost exactly the same thing in his renderings where he sets up a strong frame only to break it, to send a message that space is continuous. And then if we go to the next image, uh, then um, we see the same thing in Wright's renderings where the frame is starting to get eroded. And what he's saying is that the space, the pictorial space and the space that we're in as viewers is one and the same, that we're actually in, in the frame, in the view um, with the building. And if we go to the final image then, uh, that gets translated from picture frame at the top, picture frame and conventional architectural plan to a broken picture frame where things come in and out of the frame that don't normally get to do that. Um, and then finally, in Wright's mature architectural plans, his Usonian houses then, um, there are objects that aren't usually found inside buildings, tree, tree trunks, and building uh, parts that aren't usually found outside, like walls and columns. Um, and he starts to blur, he breaks that architectural box, then something he was very proud of. Um, again, sending the message that the made and the natural are continuous, that they're that it's a false separation when we draw a line and say, well, this is culture and this is nature. 
So um, that's kind of why I think he's important. Uh, that relationship has become um, between human beings and, and the natural environment. Obviously, in the last two decades, sustainability has become a, a massive issue. And at least formally, and to some extent ecologically, Wright was already hinting at that in the 1930s, which was way ahead of the curve, um, uh, that we are intimately, inevitably connected with the natural environment. And he was trying to get his buildings to send that message. Uh, the other big lesson, I think, as, as I touched upon was, um, how does one borrow? How does one learn from another culture without running foul or being accused of this dreadful thing that's emerged in the last 20 years, um, uh, cultural appropriation, um, which really this today's talk is, is or discussion is, is really the precursor to another one that will look at that issue um, specifically. So um, that's what I made of um, Wright in Japan, or what I think that Wright made of, of the lesson of Japan. Hmm. Is Japan in everything he did? Not everything, but I think um, th the relationship or the debt to um, his interpretation of the notion of organic was in everything. So to that extent, uh, Jay, I'd say, um, Yes, in a way, because uh, the organic applied to everything, um, to the point where that word is has become. I mean, I I don't like hearing that word because I've spent thirty years, um, at least in architecture, um, looking at its meaning, and it has dozens, literally, uh, of of different meanings. But rights was 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 fairly clear interdependence. Um, so um, pretty big, uh, you know. Wright himself said that if you took Japanese prints away from his education, he doesn't know what his career would have looked like, and I, I would, I, I wouldn't differ from that. Um, he would have been a well-known architect. Whether he would have been the same, I just don't know. But I'd like to think, um, maybe not. Um, I think that this was, he was a magpie, as as architects are. They learn from everything. But I would argue that Japan was much bigger than. Uh, many of the other influences that that, um, that Wright was was subject to. Hmm. What, what was his exposure? And did, how long did he live there? And what did he study? Yeah, um, well, he never studied for, formally, but um, he made multiple trips. He would have spent about three and a half years in total, but that's about five or six different trips, uh, Jay. And um, the longest time was building the Imperial Hotel. Um, uh, but the earliest trip was 1905 and he left finally just before the great counter earthquake uh, in 1922, 23. So um, uh, like I say, three and a half years. Um, he never really learned the language. Um, and he, he actually describes in, in, in his writings how in Japan, um, unlike in Chicago where he hated all, all the neon signs where they wore him out on the L, in, um, um, in Japan, he contrasts that and says it was a it was a blessing not to know the alphabet, that he could enjoy all these wonderful paper lanterns with their Chinese characters on, um, as pure form because he didn't understand. You know, he wasn't burdened with meaning, and he described this as being eye-minded, and that's really the way he looked at mm. uh, at Japanese culture, not through the lens of a scholar or somebody who really understood it. He understood it in his own way, um, but he never described himself as 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 a scholar, you know, he was a, he was an artist and, um, and a pretty good one. Well, when did he get famous? Was it uh, in this period or long after? Oh, uh, he was, he was becoming known, um, around 1900. Uh, it, but, um, he had been, um, initially employed in Chicago by a, a fairly respected, but not particularly well-known architect called Joseph Silsby, who actually, played a key role in connecting right to Japan. Joseph Silsby's cousin was the then leading Western expert on Japanese art, Ernest Fenelosa. So even though he may not have learned much architecturally, boy, that was an important connection. Then he works right for Louis Sullivan um, and gets fired for doing private houses on, on the quiet, um, which you know, there's a long tradition of that uh, in architecture and probably in lots of other professions. You know, Don't steal your boss's clients, otherwise expect consequences. Um, so 
you know, Wright is is out on his own, and the one thing he had that, that Sullivan didn't have, well, among many things, was this connection to Japan. I think it really did enable him to come out from under Louis Sullivan's uh, big shadow. And um, so the early part of the 20th century, right when um, Wright makes his first trip to Japan, 1905, is when he starts, right after that, he starts to get this, um, uh, the Oak Park studio and the prairie style houses really become a thing. And then he ruins it all and becomes famous for all the wrong reasons by running off with a client's wife, you know. And unfortunately, that's all that some people want to know about him. And he had his flaws, to put it this way. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've talked about Wright's debt to Japan and I'll have people come up the end and say, oh, so he wasn't original after all, which kind of, drove me crazy because uh, my the lesson that I get from all this is the real meaning of originality is is connecting things that already existed in a unique way in, in a way that's never existed you know there really is nothing new under the sun but it's everything is is new combinations so I don't I I regard this as is incredibly creative and, and original um, but Artists don't often talk about their sources for precisely that reason, because they get misinterpreted as like unoriginal and copying and, and none of what I've shown you, I would regard in, in, as a, regarded as incredibly sophisticated to take a plan and put it, um, but one that works and one that is related um, into that plan, alter it strategically to make it work. And that by the time, right was finished these were um, um even even the japanese would be hard pressed to, to uh, on the japanese is, uh, kevin on the um, japanese did I they appreciate him while he was uh, there did they appreciate him yeah. afterward did they yeah. see themselves in his work did they see his work as an as an influence on uh, architecture in japan do you see um mm -hmm. frank lloyd wright design in japan today um, the simple answer to the last one is no. Um, that you know, the conclusion seems to be that the right was a kind of one-off, and uh, it was hard to. Um, he had this unique style. He, he didn't really leave any any um, protege here, you know, that who could many disciples, but nobody who really rivaled his um, his ability or or his vision. As for whether what was he appreciated, yes, very much so. He he got a lot of um, flack from uh, on the design of the Imperial Hotel, for example, because its um, uh, decoration was very abstract, and uh, he was criticised, for example, by Antonin Raymond, one of the people who worked for him, um, for this apparently meaningless um, decoration, which was a complete misunderstanding of the meaning of of Wright's organic decoration. Was you know um, when we appreciate um, a symphony or a flower, we don't go, well, that's very nice, but what does it mean? Um, it's a purely ascetic judgment. And, and um, Wright um, says in his autobiography, and I believe him that, um, you know, American architects, it was a sport to criticize Wright because he wasn't the most modest individual in the world. Um, but Wright said, uh, oh, actually, I believe um, it was a Japanese who said, uh, yeah, we appreciated the Imperial, uh, Imperial Hotel. Um, we understood it. Which was a bit of a put down for, you know, the the critics on the other side of the Pacific who were who were putting it down. So he was appreciated, but uh, not really um, influential in the sense of uh, it stops with him. He had one important Japanese kind of assistant, uh, Arato Endo, um, who continued as an architect, and but really um, Wright's work, his style was so personal that it was very difficult. Although I would argue that um, the principles that he was interested in, this notion of incompleteness, actually is a very old uh, Japanese aesthetic principle, it goes back to the tea room. Um, and uh, there are contemporary Japanese architects uh, like Kengo Kuma, um, the guy who designed the new uh, Olympic Stadium, for example. He has a notion of anti-object where um, buildings shouldn't be separate, independent entities, but uh, should show some sort of interdependence uh, with their surroundings. And if you think about that, that's really pretty close to what Wright was arguing. 
So not in a stylistic way, Jay, but philosophically, I would say that they are, um, you know, in a kind of, um, they do have a close relationship. That this notion that it's the same in Japanese society. You know, we think of the individual first and foremost as a separate independent entity. Well, it's well known. It's true in Japan. Um, the Japanese term for myself is jibun. That literally translates as my part. And it implies that the sense of the individual, yes, you're recognized as a unique individual, but it's also your unique in contribution to a larger whole. So that kind of underlying sort of philosophy, Jay, I think there is a, there is a clear relationship. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering how somebody like Frank Lloyd Wright gets to be famous. Uh, I suppose uh, controversy is good for you. Uh, I suppose appreciation by the up and coming generations of architects um, is good for you. And, and art, uh, the, the people into art, much less architecture, um, if, if they like your work or if they um, have controversy around your work, you're going to become famous. And, and so over to, he, what did it, he died a long time ago, say 50 years ago. Um, right. No, well, that's a, that's a long time. That's in the uh, yeah, no, and I suppose yeah. he was not productive at the end anyway. Um, but but uh, I guess my question is, how do you get famous in America? Let's say America, although it's really a global question. Uh, as an right. architect like this, is it because the the art community, the architecture community, likes you um, or cares about you, or is it because Joe Schmo stands in front of one of your mm -hmm. buildings and says? I can't say why, but I really like this on some visceral level. How does that work? That, it's the second one. Um, you know, um, you had me quite worried, Jay, with the first one. I was like, I really hope it's not the first one, you know, that you have to. Wright was, for his day, he fairly, uh, you know, ahead of his time. He wrote for women's magazines. You know, he knew who, who held the purse strings and, you know, who cared about houses and, um, so he would have been, you know, he would have had a web page and, and a Twitter account and all, all of that stuff today. But it's the second one, Jay, that you can, his work resonates, it crosses boundaries. And this is so important that you didn't have to be an architect, you didn't have to know about anything to do with architecture to stand in front, as you very eloquently described, of one of his buildings and go, I don't have a clue who, who did this or I and I know nothing about architecture, but this talks to me. Somehow this person understood something about me and yet we never met. And all those millions of people who used to go to Kyoto, and I will again, they're not experts on Japanese culture, and yet they look at those temples and it resonates. Um, it crosses hundreds of years, thousands of miles, and a massive cultural difference. And that's so important for architects. To, you know, I used to bleat as an architectural student, oh, why can't the public know more about architecture? It's sort of the most idiot kind of thing you could possibly say. Um, it, but the truth, of course, is it's the other way around, that, that we as architects need to understand or remember um, what it's like to be just a regular person. And, and, um, and if your buildings resonate and can speak without a long explanation, then you really are... Um, uh, you're relevant. Otherwise, um, you know, we're in a ghetto and, and uh, talking to ourselves. So Wright's work resonates and, you know, Japanese will come and look at his work in the States. And now, um, today. they're not all experts on organic. Or, yeah. Now, today. Yeah, they still right do. Now. They come up. Yeah. And I suppose American architects uh, emulate his work, do they? Is there a, an active school, so to speak? Well, there's literally a school, Taliesin, uh, uh, and they, they are an accredited school now. Um, I don't know the degree to which they try to, I mean, I'm sure they, I know that they try to um, continue his principles without necessarily um, mimicking. Um, outside of that, Jay, no, I, I, a similar story, um, you know, Wright's style was, was, was inimitable uh, and, and, um, you know, you can learn at the level of principle, you know, emulate, but not imitate. Um, but there is a, there is a school, um, for want of a better term, of organic architecture. Um, 
and they've produced uh, stunning work, very different in many cases from Wright's work. Um, but the but this weasel term organic does tend to get interpreted in in a myriad different ways. So, um, uh, but it's I think it's a philosophical um, notion of of incompleteness and interdependence that I regard as the one thing of, of Wright's legacy that, that continues to be relevant and more so on a daily basis that we're all that we're all connected um, mm, yeah. and he was trying to say that through, through a def very difficult medium of, of buildings yeah and the incompleteness and the, the framing slide that you showed us where the things came from outside the frame things were inside the frame not customarily inside the frame uh, there's a certain what do you want to call it discomfort is that the right word? It's breaking things. It's breaking icons, and so the viewers. Yeah, mm, I mean, it's, it's you know it's like Bill Gates. Yeah. Uh, was it Bill Gates? No, Zuckerberg. Always says yeah. uh, you got to break things. That means break the old icons, break the old conventions, and and he visibly does that, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. He's 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 doing it for you know for a reason, of course, uh, to to suggest this this connectedness, this interdependence of, of everything, you know, people, of buildings and their environments, uh, you name it, um, the parts in an organism, um, it all works together and, and we're not islands, you know. Um, we can be unique, but we're also at the same time interdependent. Yeah. And that, you know, that's a great description of American democracy. I don't know who said it, but, you know, it's kind of, you get to express your, your uniqueness right up to the point where it starts to impinge on the other person's uniqueness you know and and there are limits right um and you have we're, to kind of give way to that person you know? so, we're learning about um, that there's uh, a that boundary now yeah yeah um there there is a uh, this notion of a sort of an interlock um where you know the two things are are recognizably separate but there's a, a shared um, part yeah, absolutely. You know, the, um, uh, the current crisis is is um, is making us realize that that um, yeah, I, I'm an introvert, so I don't mind um, spending a large amount of time on my own. But even I have limits. You know, I need to talk to people. I need to. You know, um, uh, we're all interlocked, interdependent. Yeah, and different times call for different appreciation of art and architecture. It's all dynamic. Uh, maybe that's the reason uh, why, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright had a period of time in which he was the most influential of all architects. Uh, but that, that ends and it sort of um, it embeds itself into the, the string, the stream of culture going forward. I wanted to ask you two yeah. more things about two more slides before we close, though. <clears throat> first, the first slide, the very first slide. Can we see the first slide for a minute with the two temples? <clears throat> Yeah, the one on the top really appeals to me. And it's not just the quality of the drawing and the colors and all that. And the reason I say that is it seems to me to be organically connected to the water. Um, there's, a, there's a certain balance and harmony about it. It's, uh, it's embedded in the water. It's part of the water. The water is part of it. Um, so I say to myself, this is harmonious. Um, and this is organic in, in my perception of the word organic. Am I right about that? I mean, how do you feel about those two drawings, those two buildings? Uh, yeah, what well, yeah, uh, uh, appears, uh, it's a, an extremely famous book, it appears on the 10 yen coin, which is on that slide. Um, that was gonna be a joke about Frank Rice Japanese debt, but it never happened. Uh, um, but the, I had not, uh, to be honest, appreciated what you, what you were just saying. Uh, I mean, that reflection is very deliberate, and and I'd not thought about it that the pool and the building are absolutely interdependent, right? If you take that pool away, it's not. So I, I think you're right. Uh, that particular building, uh, the hall door, is unusual in the sense that it's um, bilaterally symmetrical. So it's actually based on uh, a Chinese uh, kind of model. And then eventually the Japanese um, start to, uh, the Japanese, again, they interpret it as a way of, of incompleteness. So they would have looked at the Ho'oden 
or the hodo as rather too complete um you know that it doesn't leave room for um uh, completion no, that's true. But you're right that... the pool but the pool of course uh you know and the wind um that, that reflection is changing all the time so it is uh you know you're not wrong in the sense of um that the building is connected to its natural environment through the pool I, let me I ask you about that one other slide that you had and this is the slide of the stairway um mm -hmm. the stairway can we can we call that slide for a moment uh yeah the one the bottom right on these these slides i don't know what it is right. this is this is the uninitiated non-trained person just an ordinary fellow looking at that stairway and not particularly mm -hmm. recognizing that it goes nowhere that's that's right. actually a point of discomfort to find out that it right. goes nowhere um but that's that in a in a I private know. home that is really something that is so inviting it's almost uh, freudian it is so inviting it is so luscious to walk down that stairway I mean, to me, that would be a, a central feature in any private home. Um, I'm not sure why I like it so much, but uh, as soon as I saw it, when you sent those slides in, I said, this is a really special element in any home. Am I right? Yeah. I, I... It has like a lot of room um, because of Clay Lankin, the dots there, you know, and, and in the you go, you approach over a, a pond by boat, and that's how you get in. Well, that's not the case. Uh, the the stream, there's no way you could get a boat, let alone a, even a canoe, um, onto that. You know, um, so there's no way you're coming to and fro. So you're absolutely right. It's it's purely to go visit with the stream, to go engage with the water, which is beautiful, right? You know, it has no practical motive now you could argue and many people would um who has got enough money for that kind of you know um, indulgence well edgar kaufman uh, who owned a department store in pittsburgh uh, would be the guy but <laughs> but uh, you're right you know the notion that you would build a staircase just to engage with the natural element um is 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 wonderful with no motive of like i'm going down there because i don't have mains water and i'm gonna you know nope they, they had mains water Water. Yeah. It was not for practical purposes at all. Yeah. Um, pure poetry. Yeah. Kevin, it's been so nice visiting with you. I hope we can do this again. I know we will do it again soon. I really enjoy uh, your analysis and um, I, I, I warm to it. Um, anyway, we'll do it again. Kevin Newts of the School of Architecture at UH Manoa, enriching our lives with an understanding of the world around us. Thank you so much.